Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Electrical Medicine podcast. We're in beautiful Christchurch, New Zealand, um, which is uh, a wonderful new city because it was devastated by an earthquake uh, well, in 2011. And, and it's a beautiful city now. They've gone and rebuilt it and we're in the conference centre here. And uh, we just listened to a talk um, that uh, now, let me not mispronounce your name. Well, how, how did he say your name? Say my name is Paul Cactus. Fine, I'll say, I'll let you say that. <laughs> um, and uh, gave us a talk on, on something that's a bit of a black box to all of us, right? Um, um, and it, but before we get to that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you work? It's at the, uh, where, where do you work? Where do you work? Okay, so my name is Mark Kentis. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the ImageX Institute at the University of Sydney. Yes. I joined the University of Sydney a year ago, but before I was working as a, at the University of Vienna, Medical yes. University of Vienna and the Quantitative Imaging and Medical Physics Group. Yes. Uh, working on PET imagery construction and data correction. Right. So, um, so the Institute in Sydney, what, tell me a bit about what it is. So we are working on radiation therapy research, like transferring new technologies into the clinic, uh, mainly for radiation therapy, uh, external radiation therapy. And my current project there is on CT ventilation imaging, but we also use PET gallium gas, especially, or technic gas as a ground uh, treatment. Yes, yes, yes. For validating our new developments on CT ventilation. Uh -huh. but, but, but what you presented on was something a bit different. It was about, tell us a bit about what it was. So, yeah, what I presented today was a follow up on what I've been working on during my PhD, the positional range correction. We developed a method for the previous generation PET CT systems. And then I uh, continued the work to, to translate what I've done before to the latest total body pet CT systems. Right. So um, in, uh, in lots of PET scans, you have this tool uh, and lots of vendor-specific ports. Uh, in, in Siemens call it Ultra, G call it QClear. There's various of the, the systems that, that help the vendors claim improve resolution um, and um, so, what do these what do these bits of software actually do? They do make the pictures look better. What do they do? So basically, it's up to my knowledge, Siemens using only standard or some reconstructions, but you can have the resolution recovery, the points per fraction included, so the yes. DSF reconstructions. But to date, up to my knowledge, nobody is including the positional range correction. Right, and the including Siemens. Yes. Right. Um, so positional range is basically the fact that. The position is emitted from the uh, radio nuclei. Yes. And traveling a finite path and it's annihilates. And then the distance between the emission to the annihilation point is very for this position range. Right. And and this is an issue because that's going to reduce the resolution yes. of your thing. So um uh fluorine is a couple of millimeters, one or two millimeters. Yes. Uh what's uh gallium is so like for F18 is not an issue. They yeah. need to spe they, they need to account the spatial resolution of the current systems. However, for gallium 68 or iodine 124, or even if you go up to rubidium 82, which has the highest positional range, the maximum within lung tissue can go up for gallium 68 even to 30 millimeters. 30 millimeters. So that's, that's the maximum. Wow, that's well, that's three centimeters. That's yeah. a, that's a lot. Yeah. So so that's really going to reduce your resolution of your system dramatically. But even fluorine's got some some uh, positron yes. range. I mean. Only sodium twenty two, which we use for calibration of cameras, has got no positron yeah. range. So you even adding that in for the fluorine's got to help, surely. Yes, of course. So so okay, how did you do this? So in order like we can't really measure positional range, but we can use Monte Carlo simulations and then having a quite simple setup, so having a really small point source and a uniform material, then we can simulate the entire emission and all the processes until the position is annihilated. So we know the coordinates of the emission as well as the annihilation. Right. So we can calculate the position range distribution for a certain radiant applied with a certain material. Right. And and so this is material specific. Yes. So it's going to travel further in lung tissue yes. than it is in in, in in liver and it's going to travel less in bone. Yes. Than in liver, right? yes. Is that be right? Yes, exactly. So the lower the density, the, the higher the position range is going to be. So we simplify the human body at this stage to tissue density, so lung water and bone, so water being the equivalent of soft tissue. So we run three sets of simulation within these materials for different radiant flights. In today's talk, we've been focusing on gallium 68. And then based on the voxel size and the maximum positron range of the given radiant flight, we can calculate uh, 
positron range kernel that we later on incorporate into the heterogeometry construction to correct for this effect. Okay, but then it's got to be, you've got to know what tissue you're in yes. in order to work. How do you do that? So we have the attenuation correction map, and then basically, basically applying a thresholding method, we can create the material map we call, and then for every single voxel in the reconstructed image, we look into the underlying material composition. Yes. Then from the pre-calculated uniform kernels, we combine a spatially variant and tissue dependent kernel for every single voxel. Right. And we apply these kernels in the image space before the forward projection step in the iterative image reconstruction. Now, is that is that the, like an attenuation correction? You, yeah. You've got electron density, basically, that, that it determines the attenuation. Can you, is it the same as an attenuation map or is it a bit different? So, like, can you just apply an attenuation map and figure it out? Or? So, like, from the attenuation map, we already kept a quite clear uh, understanding, like, what the material composition it is. Right. So, we, we can use the new formation directly. Right. So, will it work with a CT? Will it, yeah. will it work with an MR? Yes. Like, as soon as we have a all right attenuation map, it's still, and at this stage, we simplify the human body just to speed up the processes to free different tissues. So, we have only lung, water, and bone. Right. So, it could work. Yes. Uh, when we use, if you would use it in pet and you would have a different effect since due to the magnetic field, the positional range uh, would be different. So the, it would be elongated along the z-axis. Right. That's also, uh, that's pretty the, complicated yeah. to try and work that out. So this is a bit complicated. You didn't use OSCM, which is a way of speeding up reconstruction. Yes. You used MLEM, yes. which is which is slower, but perhaps more complete and more accurate, right? Uh, yes. So they, they shouldn't be any major differences. The big difference between MLAM and OSM is the speed. Right. Uh, we had to, like, with the help of Siemens, like, we rebuilt the reconstruction tool, and it was just much easier for us to use MLAM, and it's much easier also to analyze the convergence of the reconstruction, so we can see, like, uh, when it's, like, similar to behavior of reconstruction, since we, we changed the images. Right. Also, like, OSM or the MLAM reconstruction doesn't have a stopping rule. So you start a reconstruction and at a certain point you, when you think, okay, now you recover the activity and the image noise is also acceptable, you stop your reconstruction. But if you modify the inputs, like you apply your position range correction, then the behavior of reconstruction can change. Right. Uh, sometimes you have to iterate more or less. Uh, we've been analyzing this in our previous study when we did position range correction for the uh, MCT system, the previous yes. generation. And there is also other way of implementing positional range correction. So what we do now, we apply it just before the forward projection step. Ah, okay. We then we let the reconstruction run in the same way. But if you would like to have like the full implementation implementation we call, then you would also need to add the positional range correction on the back projective correction image. Something similar is done for the PSF. Right. Uh, uh, the only so the PSF is applied in the back correction step, not in the forward projection step. It's done in both steps, since right. the back projection is a transpose operation of the forward projection. So yes. uh, if you think as a physicist, we say, like what you want to have, that when you compare your estimated sinogram to your measured sinogram, you want to have all the corrections in the estimated sinogram to be as close as possible to the measured one. But since we do it like uh, in before the forward projection, then to be correct fully mathematically, you would need to do it in the back projection step. However, the kernels are spatially variant, so this additionally induces a lot of more calculations. Right. And then we did the study and we could show that it's enough to do it. When you do it combined with PSF, then it's enough to do it before the post so, projection. So is this computationally intensive work? Is it is it very computationally intensive? Can it, can it take 10 minutes or 20 minutes? Uh, so currently, uh, for the total body system, like to do the uh, position range correction, just the simplified version, it takes about 38 minutes per iteration. Right. But this was a proof of concept, so the first uh, time that we implemented it, and we definitely can speed it up at least 20 minutes. Uh, I have a couple of ideas how to do that. Right. Uh, and obviously, this could be also be added directly into uh, the projectors, and that would be much faster. Right. And, and of course, it's going to be a lot quicker if you use the smaller field of view camera, like yeah, a vision or something along those lines. So, really, it could be a way that we could uh, really enhance uh, the, the, the the resolution of our PET scans, right? Yes. So, um, and of course, uh, I mean, one of the things we see when we do point spread function, all these things, the pictures also look smoother. 
is it's because we're stopping the iterations earlier, or is it because, or is it because, it, or or is it because because we don't need to go as far, or is it because, um, uh, or is it because we can the the resolution is actually that smooth? I think it's the former rather than the later, but you tell me. Yes, first, like if you add the PSA, then it would change the convergence of the reconstruction, and if you would use the same reconstruction settings, the same number of iterations with and without with and without PSA, then of course with PSA you will have smoother images, but you right. can still recover more at the same time. So right. it really depends on what you would like to have better recovery, smoother images. Uh, right. So, 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 so what you're really trying to say is that if you want to get complete recovery when you're using a point spread function, you should iterate more. Yes. So we were looking into this and then in our previous study and then we had to iterate for the MCT system. Yes. Uh, we are like we wanted to match the background noise in the images when we did some phantom studies yes. and then compare the recoveries. And then when we kind of had the similar background noises, we could show that we have much better recovery using the position range fraction. Right. So now one thing we do see when we use point spread function or Q or whatever all these type of things, we see this Gibbs artifact. It's yes. ring around the outside of activity. Uh, but it's not the same on every system, right? So I notice on when we had an MCT, we had a much bigger ring than we see on the vision. Why is that? Why is it different? So I had never worked with other systems than Siemens. Right. So, uh, up to my knowledge, QClear is a bit different uh, reconstruction method right. than the standard OSM. Uh, but the Gibbs artifact is going to be there. It's a well-known issue from PSF. Yes. Uh, of course, when we do positional range correction, we, we kind of again, see the Gibbs artifacts to be even more pronounced. Right. Uh, in our case, what we can do, basically, we can adjust the uh, size of the kernels, and with this one, we can limit somehow the Gibbs artifacts, but it's mainly happening at the sharp edges, and we did a lot of phantom studies where you have, like, a water phantom, and next to it here. So it's a really sharp border, uh, okay. which usually you won't see with inside a patient, for example. So why do we see a less of the Gibbs artifact on a vision than you would on an MCT? And the, MC, the vision's intrinsically high resolution system. Yeah. Does that mean that it's because it's not pushing that point spread function as hard? I would say so. So 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 yeah, so the so because you're not pushing that point spread function as hard, you're not producing the Gibbs artifacts. Right, right. But that also means you can then iterate more and recover more. Yeah more information at the same time. Right, so the, the, there's a lot of little tricks in there. This means that really, I mean, how to put this? Pet reconstructions hasn't changed much in 20 years. Yes. Right? It's about time it did, don't you think? Yes, first. Like, um, <laughs> that's a bit interesting. Like, if I go to conferences, I see a lot of new algorithms being developed in yes. the research field. But for some reason, the vendors don't really implement it in their software. Uh, but you're working with the vendors now, right? Uh, when we started to work on position range correction in Vienna, yes. then yes, we've been working together with the vendors, and I think they have an interest for this particular reconstruction that we are working on. No. But there are a lot of regularized reconstructions, for example, one of them being QClear for GE. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be nice to see more of those algorithms. Right, there. and some of those ones are going to incorporate different rates of convergence in different parts of the image based on count density, which is probably what could be good. But probably it's just a word. We don't really know what's going inside that black box, right? Kind of, yes. <laughs> and even in Siemens, we don't really know, but you yeah. could, but, but obviously you've been able to untangle some of it because you've been able to add in extra features and do L and M, right? Yes. So... Yeah, no, this is an area now we're doing a lot more pet. We're trying to detect really low levels of tumours, really small tumours. We're trying to uh, measure really low levels of amyloid and tau. We need to actually improve our pet scanning, not just with the hardware, with the software yeah. as well. So it's about time we actually implemented what you're doing. And thank you so much for doing that. Of course. I really appreciate it. Is there anything else you'd like to tell everybody about what you're doing? Or uh, people you'd like to thank or whatever? Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the team in Vienna, yes. the Medical University of Vienna. We started to work on this project together before I moved to Sydney. And uh, also what we built is like really easily extendable. So what we what I presented today was specifically for Gallium 68. However, we already simulated a couple of other radiant flights that we can easily implement it into our framework. And we developed position range correction for pretty much, not all, but a few Siemens systems. So if 
anyone is interested in collaborating or applying this technology. We have it for the previous generation MCT as well as for the vision with the shorter axial field of view as well as for the total body. Right. And and uh, so and, and it's, that's important what you're saying. So part of the reason why cardiac pit hasn't taken off with rubidium is that their pitches are just woeful as far as pit goes. They're not much better than than, than spec pitches because of that positron range business. But if we can fix that, then suddenly cardiac pit becomes, you know, comes a lot better. Um, I mean, that's, that, that, that's a classic place. So there's lots of situations where this this technology really could make a huge difference. Yeah, awesome. And and such fantastic work. Thank you so much Thanks for very much. taking part in the podcast. Really well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you.